molecular imaging and the evolution of nuclear medicine over the last 40 years. In fact, I have seen the nuclear medicine growing from the 1977 onwards. And if we look at the scenario of imaging that we heard and Professor Rosenberg's talk gave me a lot of insights into what exactly we in the molecular imaging can go ahead in the years to come to answer some of the unanswered questions. Nuclear medicine has two types of scans, the gamma scans and the PET scan. 70s up to the arrival of the CT scan, nuclear imaging and the X-rays form the core of orthopedic practice. It's only after the advent of the CT, the role of nuclear medicine in orthopedics has regressed to some extent. We had the conventionally the phosphate bone scans, which were the hallmark of a orthopedic practice. And in the last 10 years, the PET CT scans, which are looking at the biological molecules in a human cell, that has come into the front. 2002 was a revolution in clinical medicine because the fusion imaging came into being in 2002. And that has changed the scenario of diagnosis and thought processes as far as the disease is concerned. The bone scan, all you are aware that it just tells us the tumor and we try to stage for the metastasis. One of the best role of this was uh, grading the tumor. But this scan was highly sensitive, least specific. However, since there was no other modality, this continued for a long period. We also used in musculoskeletal disorder an interesting technique evolution, what we call as the three-phase bone scan, where the tumor blood flow is imaged in the first one minute. Then the blood pool image will tell about the tumor and the surrounding soft tissue. And finally, the delayed static image will tell us the metastatic component from this particular tumor. Now here, if you see the central area of the tumor is necrotic and the peripheral there is vascularity, whereas in the, there is no metastasis on a bone scan. Now this image would tell us what is the impact of this tumor on the adjoining tissue as far as the vascularity is concerned, because that would have an impact on the surgical management. So this technology continued till the CT scan came. In fact, in 1990, when I was at Memorial Sloan Kettering, we were using this scan even for chemotherapy response assessment. Disappearance of vascularity would say that the tumor has responded. We moved on because the seat, unless there's anatomy, the surgeon would not be able to look at those hot spots. So we got this fusion imaging coming in the first part of this 2000. And what you see, the CT fused with the bone scan and you can see the uptake of the tumor in the soft tissue and also the component of the bone involved after fusion. This is called as a SPECT CT bone scan. So the fusion of CT to the tomographic bone scan enhanced the specificity by another 50 to 20 percent. But the MR and CT resolution is unmatchable. That is why this technology is standing still at the backwards when you look at the guiding in terms of metastasis and other processes in the onco setting. I was involved in this work at the Memorial Sloan Kettering in 1994. This got published in the European Journal that we had an isotope called thallium and cis -tamibi. This isotope goes to the mitochondria of the tumor and the thallium also is taken up by the tumor cells and not by an infection cells. So if you look here, the bone scan showed a hot spot, but the MIBI scan does not show any uptake, suggesting this is a benign lesion. So that is how we made a paper along with my colleague Scott from Ludwig Cancer Center. Whereas if you see this lesion on the bone scan and the MIBI scan showing hot uptake, we used to call it as a malignant tumor, not specifying the disease, but benign versus malignant. So that paper has continued for a long time. And in fact, we used it almost for a decade. A lot of work is still existing. I personally still believe that thallium scan should continue in a country like India where a lot of PET scans do not exist. Because the recent paper from the Cornell says 
response assessment on thallium scan and the glucose PET scan, the same sensitivity. And the cost is only 5,000 rupees versus a 25. But it is sad that the technique has not been applied even in India also. As the bone scan we did, and you look at this interesting scan. This is a fluoride PET bone scan, and this is a MDP bone scan on the same patient. Look at the amount of lesions picked by the fluoride and the MDP. So 40% of the lesions not seen on a MDP bone scan are seen on a fluoride PET bone scan. So at Bombay Hospital today, in the last three months, I have instituted this technique, almost replaced the MDP bone scan. And additionally, here you get a details of the CT of the chest and the liver, which is also like a staging for that particular bone tumor. So fluoride bone scan is one of the important thing. You can see here a subchondral cyst, nicely demonstrated, not well seen on a MDP bone scan, and an enchondroma, also not well seen on, it is seen here, but with the CT fusion, you can make a diagnosis. So fluoride PET bone scan is the standard of practice. I would like to say here that all of us should practice this even in a musculoskeletal setting. This is an interesting scan, you can see one lesion in the MDP bone scan, but multiple metastatic lesions in the fluoride in a malignant histiocytoma. So the fluoride PET bone scan to me is now the in thing. Moving on to molecular imaging, we, have, we call them as molecular imaging because we are using here the molecules in the human cell with respect to the disease evolution and the disease processes like glucose, fatty acids, amino acids. They are all labeled with different isotopes. With respect to the musculoskeletal, this has formed the core of the diagnostic technique. This is now in the offing and this is also already in the practice. Conceptually speaking for my young colleagues, normally glucose is taken by the biological cell, undergoes a glucose phosphate then energy liberation through a glycolysis process. But when you radio label a glucose, it localizes in the cell, but does not undergo glycolysis, remains tapped in the human cells, and that is why we call it as a glucose PET scan. What you see here is the biochemistry of glucose in the entire human body, myocardium, and it is excreted through the kidney into the bladder, that's the bone marrow, and that's the liver. Glucose is a normal in biological cell up to one to two times the glucose is taken up when you inject. But a malignant tumor takes glucose six to eight times more than a normal biological cell and hence comes as an abnormal area on a PET scan. The fusion of CT made a phenomenal difference in 2002 because if you look at it here, where are these lesions we would not be able to in tell you, but with the fusion of the CT, you can say that they are nodal disease. So the anatomical location of a abnormal metabolic area made a major impact in the oncology. We also generate quantitative data from a glucose PET scan, what is normally referred to as SUV. This is a metabolic activity of the tumor. Higher is this value, more aggressive is the tumor. There is a direct relationship between glucose and the cancer spread. 2011, Stanford University gave a data on 27,000 PET scans done in all cancers in a metastatic setting. The outcome is all tumors in a metastatic setting are glucose positive. So glucose drives the metastatic process in a cancer. That is the current thought process going on in the imaging and in the other uh, basic sciences. This particular value is also very useful in assessing the response to treatment. So the current role in musculoskeletal scenario is for staging of high grade sarcomas. In low grade sarcomas, it is not a recommendation. Prognosis through metabolic grading is one of the signal contribution of the glucose PET scan in the musculoskeletal disorders. Restaging of a metastatic sarcoma, which is considered for either liver or lung metastatectomy, again the glucose PET scan is an indication. 
response assessment to me as we stand it comes top on the list in terms of drug response or radiation response. Finally, the UK group recently has made an interesting evidence based recommendation of assessment of a malignant transformation in the neurofibromatosis to sarcomatous change. That is why I asked Professor Rosenberg what would be the marker and here it appears glucose is acting as a marker from benign to malignancy. Benign neurofibromatosis there is no uptake. A neurofibroma with high glucose uptake is a converted malignant neurofibroma. Now that is an interesting evidence based indication published last month from the UK group. Staging if you look at this PET scan that is the tumor a soft tissue malignant tumor showing differential pattern of metabolism and no disease except one small iliac node no other disease elsewhere. So the staging can be done both in terms of metabolic as well as on the CT scan because they are all contrast CT images. This is an interesting tumor extraskeletal extra osseous wing sarcoma showing absolutely no metastasis highly localized disease amenable for surgery. This is another staging tumor of the distal end of the femur with no metastasis. So what is the impact? that this has produced is that 20 to 27 percent across the literature the FDG PET when interposed between clinical diagnosis and histological diagnosis and surgery if we interpose PET CT 20 to 27 percent times it alters the treatment in the form of neoadjuvant chemotherapy followed by surgery or no surgery at all showing the extent of metastasis. So the impact in staging is significant in musculoskeletal oncology. Now to me prognosis on FDG PET CT in India very sadly we are not attributing this. It is just a tumor is reported and nothing is happening. I think that is a wrong report. If you look at the reports that are coming from Europe and the West in every PET CT report I must tell what could be the probable prognosis of this tumor. The glucose uptake in the primary tumor has a prognostic value that is the most important point and if you see here this tumor which has a high glucose uptake 16.5 such tumors even after resection will have a high incidence of recurrence rate and poorer survival. The data is already accumulated in 14 multicenter studies that are already published. As report to that if you look at this tumor there is hardly any uptake here but there is a very heterogeneous uptake with a low glycolytic rate such tumors have a high good prognosis with good survival. Soft tissue sarcoma on a FDG PET high grade and intermediate grade 92 percent sensitivity and 93 percent specificity across all literature that is published as of now. Low grade lesion sarcoma PET is not recommended because there is hardly any uptake in those tumors. The benign soft tissue lesions like leomyoma, fibroma do not show uptake. So when some images were being shown one of my thought processes if on a radiological setting it is looking like a benign lesion if you do a PET and if you show no glucose it almost confirms a benignity for that lesion. Now in terms of the prognosis which I was talking if the ratio is more than 10 it is associated with poor prognosis this is one standard statement as we currently made in all the literature. 35 percent reduction in ratio after neoadjuvant chemo favors a good prognosis that is how we use in a response assessment setting. Less than 40 percent reduction in the ratio and the glucose ratio is more than 6 it favors a high recurrence rate and a poor survival. So the values when we interpret a PET scan we have got to give this value to the surgeon so that an appropriate assessment is made with regard to further treatment. And it is now the last paper which just came about few months ago says after two courses of chemotherapy if we show a 35 percent reduction in the glycolytic rate that tumor has an excellent outcome. 
This is the data which shows very nicely using a Kaplan meal analysis that all those the tumors who had a high ratio, they had a very poorer survival compared to those tumors whose glycolytic rate was much, much less. And this is now well documented not only in musculoskeletal but in lung cancer, in breast cancer, across all other cancers as well. Treatment response, that's the primary tumor pre-chemotherapy and after four cycles of chemotherapy, phenomenal reduction in the glycolytic rate, suggesting an excellent response. At this time, neither the MR nor the CT would show any significant structural change. So the RESIST criteria, which even today continues to be the scale for the prognosis assessment, falls short of the metabolic scale in assessing the response rate. So I think PET-CT will stand. And if you look at this interesting case, a large pelvic rhabdomyosarcoma, which we had recently with a high glycolytic tumor, after three course of chemotherapy, look at the phenomenal response that the tumor has shown and here surgery was postponed and continued with the chemotherapy to see whether there is a complete resi metabolic resolution of the disease. So the FDG PET impacts the decision making during response assessment. This is another patient, almost complete resolution. Hardly 10% of the disease left. Such patients would need full course of chemotherapy. Now coming to glucose PET scan has remained, it will remain in certain areas. I'm moving on to newer trends that are coming in musculoskeletal radiology uh, tumors. Thymidine PET scan, choline PET scan, and what is called as tyrosine PET scan. These are evolving. At Bombay Hospital, I have started the first PET scan. Why I had started doing this is glucose PET scan is highly sensitive, but not necessarily tumor specific. It is not a specific tracer. We need to know is the tumor proliferating rapidly or not? That's a critical issue. So thymidine is a proliferative marker on a PET scan, what I call as in vivo histology. That is the future that we are now getting. I'll just show you a few scans here. This is a patient who had a primary lesion here and pulmonary metastasis. The thymidine PET scan, hardly any uptake you see here. But look at the glucose PET scan, very high uptake. At histology, the primary tumor KI index was less than 2%, hardly any proliferation. Whereas the metastatic cells were 10% KI. But the glucose PET scan was showing very high uptake. Why this discordance? Because in glucose PET scan, not only the tumor. So with this little insight into the metabolic image, I want to conclude my talk showing an interesting moving story which I came across. This dog, bear and boomer, this bear dog ha while playing had a fracture and when x-rayed had a tumor. So the vet told the owner he has a cancer. But the vet said, what cancer? So he said a bone cancer. What happens? He said he can treat and all that. He, believe me, he went ahead and treated and the tumor shrunk. In six months the pulmonary meds came, he did not give up. He went ahead and gave the chemotherapy. At the end of five years, this dog is phenomenally playing. The story what that comes out is, this is not a tumor to give up. If you study the biology, everything clear, and institute the therapy at appropriate level, we can win over even this sort of a disease process. On that note, thank you very much for patient hearing. Now, and various other factors. Today, the f software takes all the variables which were a problem all these years into consideration while calculating the SUV. So that issue has been addressed now. Secondly, I believe very strongly that the decade of the molecule, the sorry molecular century, was glucose (FDG). But now I believe probably. We have to personalize each patient's thymidine probably may, may come as a good surrogate marker depending upon the type of the tumor. At histology level, if they say KI index is 70%, you will go for a thymidine PET scan because a highly proliferating tumor. If you send low KI, 
probably would st stick to glucose. And in the years to come, we are going to see some other molecules like angiogenesis molecules and apoptosis molecules. All these are going to act as different surrogate markers with respect to that disease, both at the diagnostic level and at the response assessment level. And I, I believe Professor Rosenberg's thought, it's a fascinating decade that we are looking from now on. Yes. Well, one reason why we had such a long wait before we spoke about biopsy is because this is how it should be in any tumor that we see. We must look at all the imaging, get all the information that we can get prior to doing anything invasive and before planning the biopsy. And that's the reason why biopsy is always done later. But we also know that it is important to do the biopsy and not jump into surgery without having a histological confirmation of what we are doing unless there are certain exceptional situations which we will talk about where biopsy is not necessary. But most of the time we have to have a histopathological diagnosis irrespective of how typical the radiology is and how confident we are of the diagnosis. The other misconception is that biopsy is an easy minor procedure and I think today's world I would say that biopsy is a very high risk procedure. It's not high risk for the surgeon who's doing it, it's high risk for the patient. It is because there are so many mistakes made in doing a biopsy that it becomes a problem for limb saving surgery when, when, when they go on to the centers. Now a very interesting study came from Dr. Mankin. He did this study twice. First he did this study in 1982. They submitted questionnaires to all the members of the Musculoskeletal Tumor Society to find out what they would biopsy, their biopsy habits, etc. And they found that there was a 4.5% rate of an unnecessary amputation, which means an amputation which was caused only because of a badly done or a wrongly done biopsy. So then what they decided to do is to educate all the surgeons and to see if that made a difference after giving everybody the information about the biopsy. They did a survey once again in 1996 and very surprisingly it made no change. And this is exactly what we see everywhere in the world is that most surgeons just listen to what should be done for a biopsy but don't apply it in their practice. Therefore, the only message of this particular talk is going to be is that if you are going to do the biopsy, please do it very carefully. Now, I'm going to show you some examples to tell you what happens when the biopsy is done wrongly. This was a 60-year-old lady who had a soft tissue tumor in the popliteal fossa. This was an intermediate grade malignant tumor, but the surgeon did an open biopsy with a transverse scar and then contaminated the neurovascular bundle when he went down from the posterior approach. And uh, after, the, after we saw the repeat MR, we realized that the entire popliteal fossa has been dissected with contamination all around the neurovascular bundle. So there was no way we could have salvage this situation and this patient had an amputation only because the biopsy was done very badly. This is another patient who had a proximal tibia osteosarcoma and you can see the huge open biopsy scar and you can see that the drain site is on the opposite side. Again this patient underwent an amputation only because of the extent of contamination which has been caused by the open biopsy which was otherwise quite a salvageable disease. This is a young girl whose x-ray clearly showed this kind of a blastic lesion. You can see here, you can see some periosteal reaction which was missed by the surgeon who was seeing her. I don't know why he thought that this was a pigmented villonodular synovitis. When I spoke to him and I asked him, why did you do a biopsy from two sides? He said to get better amount of tissue from two sides. Now again, this patient would require an amputation just because uh, the biopsy has been done badly. It may be difficult now to give any good function because the amount of extent of contamination of the cordyceps and the knee joints. Therefore, more, very often after the biopsy, uh, many of us who do limb salvage surgery will, will be looking like this when we look at the biopsy scars. 
And I can tell you that these are not infrequent. Every week, we get a badly done biopsy which we can photograph and keep showing. I mean, we can have a series of more than 1,000 cases where the biopsy has been done improperly. But if you, if you look at the cases where the biopsy has been done properly, that will be very small. This patient had three open biopsies and no surgeon wanted to use the tract done by the old one, so they have made three scars. This patient again, biopsy from a different side, drain at a different side. Big hatch marks in an open biopsy means more skin to be removed. Same, same problem, I mean badly done open biopsy. Open biopsy with lot of contamination, bruising and ecchymosis. Bad, again open biopsy and not just on one side, this was on two different sides. Scapular tumor biopsied from three different sides and none of them in the correct line of incision for the scapulectomy. Open biopsy resulting in infection. Open biopsy done from two different sites and in addition causing infection. Therefore, uh, making limb salvage surgery virtually impossible. The question again which I have to ask everybody is that are we justified in doing a biopsy in today's era when you have limb salvage rates of almost 90 percent and survival rates of 70 percent, should we do a procedure which is likely to compromise this chance of the patient? So the, the message again is going to be no open biopsy except by a team which is doing the final procedure because they would understand what is going to be their incision, they can excise that tract and they know that open biopsy is required very rarely. Most of the time you can do a needle biopsy and get a good diagnosis. What is the aim of biopsy? The aim of biopsy is to get a tissue diagnosis causing the least amount of trauma to the patient. We don't need to remove a huge chunk of tissue to get a diagnosis. We have good pathologists today, very competent pathologists today who can give you a diagnosis on a small amount of tissue. Therefore, needle biopsy is very attractive because it is cheap. It often does not require the patient to be taken to the operating theater. It can be done under local anesthesia. If there is a soft tissue mass, it can be done as an office procedure. And uh, the cost becomes much lower and especially in India where costs are so important. I think this is something to take into account. And you can always do an open biopsy in case the needle biopsy does not give us a diagnosis. Now we know from several studies including our own that needle biopsy has a good accuracy and gives you representative tissue in, in almost 90 percent of the cases. Besides you can see that this amount of skin which is resected is very small in a needle biopsy. In fact, as Dr. Shah Alam was pointing out today, probably we don't even need to resect a needle biopsy tract. I would be a little more worried about an open biopsy tract because we know the contamination is a lot more than what we have with needle biopsies. It does not mean that needle biopsies are safe. Needle biopsies can also result in a lot of contamination. You can see a lot of ecchymosis around this needle biopsy because pressure was not applied to stop the bleeding after the biopsy. Here you can see needle biopsy is done from two different sides of the tumor again without anticipating that you may have to resect the biopsy tract. Now as I started off in this talk, the biopsy therefore should be done with proper planning only after we have finished all the imaging. As surgeons, we have this thing that when we look at an x-ray, when we look at a lesion, we guess what the tumor is and we want an immediate answer. So we think, tend to do the biopsy immediately without doing the imaging so that we know what it is and we can tell the patient what it is. Now look at this example. Uh, this patient underwent a biopsy for a apparent soft tissue tumor on the dorsum of the foot. They did not do an MRI before and they missed that there is a big tumor. It is probably coming from the bone and there is a huge component on the plantar aspect as well. And therefore, we say that you must do the biopsy only after you have done the imaging so that you can plan the biopsy much better. Now we have already discussed in what way a biopsy can alter the appearance of imaging. So we would prefer to have the MRIs done or the scans done including a PET CT also can show a lot of change once an open biopsy has been done. So I think it is best 
Dr. Krishna will agree that what suppose an open biopsy has been done, would you be reliable in your SUB values? No. Needle biopsy probably would not alter it so much, but an open biopsy I think is, is something to be done last. The other reason why, again when we discussed, we said we do uh, imaging first is to identify what would be the best site to do the biopsy. Now this was a very large soft tissue tumor in the thigh very necrotic in the center and there were very few solid areas and therefore this is a patient where I would certainly use an ultrasound to direct where the biopsy should be from so that the chance of getting a positive diagnosis is much higher and we always use a frozen section to make sure that we have got representative material because otherwise you wait three or four days to get a diagnosis and then again you realize you don't have enough representative tissue and you've lost that time and you once again will repeat the biopsy. So wherever there is a chance that you don't have enough representative tissue, it is a good idea to use a frozen section and make sure that we have adequate material. Again, the question which many surgeons have in their mind is, can we not avoid a biopsy in certain tumors which are typical? Well, I'm going to show you a case and ask you, what do you think of this 11-year-old girl who presented with pain on the shin? And uh, it, was a, it was a first episode of pain, it, it is very acute and when the radiographs were done, this is what they showed. I think if you go by what Dr. Letson said, this is a, a, a geographic lesion with a sclerotic rim and this has a very low chance of being malignant. And uh, it was opined, it was this, this patient incidentally was in the US at that time, so as it happens the films were sent to three different centers. and. All the radiologists were uniform in their opinion that this looks like a non-ossifying fibroma and that it should be observed. Uh, this, this patient had relatives in India. Her uncle was an orthopedic surgeon. And when she came down to India because she had pain, he decided that he must do something about it. And he went ahead and saw all the reports that this is a benign tumor and he went ahead and curated this lesion. This was a high-grade osteosarcoma. Now this is very unusual. But this happens. We know that this happens. When you see a large number of tumors, there will be some which don't obey the rules. And some of these will tend to cause embarrassment. That uncle is unable to now show his face to the family because this girl required a much bigger resection at the end of what could have been an easy problem. And if he had done the biopsy before, probably he could have avoided this embarrassment. Though radiologically this was looking benign, it wasn't benign. This was another boy which was, who had a lytic lesion. This does not look benign, but the surgeon assumed that this is an aneurysmal bone cyst for some reason and went ahead and curated this. This was a telangiectetic osteogenic sarcoma. And then again, now problems because of contamination, you may end up with a bigger resection. This is a 32-year-old male who presented with thigh pain and fever. In, in our country, our first diagnosis is always an infection because at 32 years of age, you think infection is more common than tumor. These are the MRI images. It was thought to be a chronic osteomyelitis and again, no biopsy was done. The surgeon did an extensive debridement. He put in antibiotic cement beads, assuming that this is infection. Final report was an osteosarcoma. This is the situation and this patient now probably needs an amputation. Another patient, big soft tissue mass, assumed to be uh, infection but was an osteosarcoma. Another young boy, there was a periosteal reaction here, thought to be infection because of the acute onset of pain, debrided, this was an Ewing sarcoma. Yet another patient, who had a painful swelling in the mid thigh, a 10 year old, big mass on the MRI. But look at what the radiologist reports. And I'm showing this with our radiologists here because there are many radiologists who don't see tumors regularly, but they have big opinions. And here he has reported, I do not see signs of osteogenic sarcoma. And this made the surgeon believe that this is infection though there were obvious signs of this being a tumor and he did not biopsy this and he went and curated this and this was an osteogenic sarcoma. So how much can you rely on 
the radiology or even the radiology reports. I'll show you another tibial lesion. You can see an obvious lamellated periosteal reaction happening here. I had uh, spoken about biopsies in, in one of the meetings in Bombay and this surgeon had attended that and, and the moment he had this patient, he sent this patient over to me for a biopsy saying that you always said that even what looks like an infection should be biopsy, so I am sending it to you for the biopsy. I looked at the images and I thought that this looks more likely to be an infection, but we did the biopsy because we have to follow the rules and this was a lymphoma. So uh, even after seeing many, many cases like this, I don't think we are quite certain when we see these tumors as to whether this is infection or biopsy. So the rule again is that you must biopsy. Anything is not considered as an infection unless it is proven conclusively that this is an infection. Now you can see in this image, these are three different lesions looking identical on the x-ray. Even I don't remember now which one is what, but one of them was a MET, one of them was tuberculosis and one of them was chronic osteomyelitis. So the, again, we come down to that it is impossible on plain x-rays to be certain about what it is and we must have a biopsy before we decide what we are going to treat. Uh, our pathologist Dr. Chinoy always used to show this slide. She says that surgeons tend to have what is called as an oculobrachial reflex. Normally when you see fractures, uh, there is a lot of thinking as to what is to be done, where the plate should be applied, what implant should be used and a lot of cortical input goes in. But when we see a tumor somehow there is a short circuit and direct impulses go to the hand, to the muscles of the hand and you want to excise that tumor off and that is what is called as an oculobrachial reflex. And again the message to all surgeons is please stop the oculobrachial reflex. I think we need to think when we see a tumor. Uh, it's WHOOPS procedure is a properly described procedure. It means that you have removed a tumor thinking that this is benign and you get a shock when you see the pathology report saying it is malignant and you say whoops. So it's called as a whoops procedure. It means that you now need to uh, image more, resect more, probably require plastic surgery where otherwise you would have got away with a primary closure. Uh, we spoke about that patient, somebody wanted to know more details about this case. This was a young boy who was playing football and he uh, had a fall, he had a pathological fracture. This is an obvious pathological fracture, but when he went to the hospital, it was considered as an emergency. No imaging, no MRIs, no biopsy. They straight away went ahead and did a intramedullary nailing. They thought this is a unicameral bone cyst. And what they thought is that during the reaming, whatever they get from inside the marrow, they will send for pathology. They sent for pathology and that reported normal bone. So uh, this patient was being followed up for three months. Uh, he seemed to be fine. Uh, the fracture seemed to be healing. And then he presented with a large thigh mass at about four or five months after his uh, surgery. And at that time we got the MRI done and as Aditya has shown that despite the nail we could get good information out of that MRI. We did a biopsy and this was a high grade uh, sarcoma. This wasn't an osteosarcoma but this was a high grade pleomorphic sarcoma. So this patient was then put onto chemotherapy and then uh, we had to do a total femur replacement. As somebody asked that time why did we do a total femur is because the entire medullary canal has been contaminated through the tumor. And you now need to, uh, for a wide excision, you would need to remove the entire bone. So we had to do a total femur. This is, this is not something isolated. This happens pretty frequently. This is another lytic lesion which was nailed saying that it requires prophylactic fixation. And this was a 40-year-old lady. And uh, no biopsy done. No biopsy taken. No imaging done. This was uh, done like this. Left till the time the patient never got relief of pain, then they did a biopsy and this was a chondrosarcoma, grade 2 chondrosarcoma. So again, a message that we should not be putting in nails or prophylactic fixations or even fixations for pathological fractures thinking it is an emergency. I think they require workup. They need, you can easily spend a few days in trying to get a accurate diagnosis. So again, coming back to the questions, do we need to biopsy all the tumors? And the general good rule is that anything which you are going to operate, 
is best biopsied, whether it is benign or malignant. Even if it is, if you think it's a giant cell tumor and you're going to curate it, I think it is best to do a biopsy and confirm the diagnosis before one goes down and does the curatage. Anything which looks obviously malignant on X-rays, as again Dr. Letson has shown, what are the criteria where you start thinking that there is a high chance of this being a malignant tumor. When you see a periosteal reaction, when you see a lot of cortical destruction, I think these are certainly tumors that you would biopsy before you go in for surgery. On the other hand, there are certain characteristic situations, for example, osteochondromas. Now, osteochondromas don't require a biopsy. I think they are quite characteristic on imaging. And if we have taken a proper history, we know the patient has had them for a long time. They may have become painful. They may have grown a little bit in size with the normal growth of the patient. Then I don't think you require to biopsy them. And they're treated based on whether they're symptomatic and they require treatment or not. Uh, osteoid osteomas often don't require any biopsy. The lesion in any case is so small that it is best to treat it instead of uh, trying to do a biopsy. Again, the imaging is so characteristic that it is very uh, difficult to make a wrong diagnosis based on imaging alone. Now, this, this is again a young boy who has been treated for 11 months as uh, uh, tuberculosis. But this was actually an uh, osteoid osteoma. And they had not done a CT, they had done only an MR, they saw uh, inflammation in the marrow and they assumed this is infection, it was not biopsied, the child never had relief of pain and that's when they were referred and then they got a CT scan done and the osteoid osteoma was then uh, radio frequency ablated and the child had complete relief. Uh, you have certain other uh, findings, I mean there are times when you pick up something which is an incidental lesion, the patient is not symptomatic for that lesion but the patient has had a fall, you've done imaging and you find that there is something there which has probably been there for a long time and these lesions can be observed. I think each time you see a case like this, you really need to assess whether this patient is symptomatic because of this or not and then take a call. This is a typical again a fibrous cortical defect which alarm bells went ringing when some surgeon told them that this could be osteogenic sarcoma in an 11 year old but this is a classic fibrous cortical defect. This is another 60 year old man who had come with uh, sciatica like pain and the x-ray had shown this lesion. Now this was sent to me for a biopsy but when, when I saw the patient clinically it was obvious that this is not the lesion which is causing the symptoms. Again it looks like something which is healed. There is sclerosis even within the lesion, surrounding the lesion, extremely well defined. So what we did was to do a bone scan and we did a bone scan with the assumption that if this lesion was active then it would show up on the bone scan as a hot spot. So if it shows up as a hot spot, we said we will do the biopsy. Otherwise, we will just observe this patient. And we did the bone scan and there was absolutely no activity in that lesion. It was exactly the same as what was in the surrounding bone. So we just observed this patient and it hasn't changed over the last five years. So we know that this is not something which needed a biopsy. So sometimes one can add an imaging, one can add an MRI, one can add a bone scan and then take a decision as to whether this lesion requires a biopsy or not. We don't usually biopsy something which is an obvious lipoma because fat again is very easily recognized on MRI and I think the radiologists have a fair degree of confidence in saying that this is a lipoma or a very well differentiated liposarcoma or what we call as an atypical lipoma. And uh, there is not, no advantage gained by doing a biopsy, you don't learn anything extra. So if these require resection, if the decision is taken to remove them, then you remove them without a biopsy. But for that, again, we must be very certain that this is a lipoma. Not all deep soft tissue lesions are, are lipomas. We've already discussed chondroid tumors at length, and I'm not going to now talk about this. Uh, the next question which is often asked is, can you do a frozen section on the operating table and then take a decision? For example, suppose this is an obvious uh, benign lesion or a giant cell tumor, can you not do a frozen section and, and then take a decision to go ahead and curate this lesion instead of subjecting the patient to a biopsy? The answer is yes, one could do it, but uh, I, I, I would want Dr. Rosenberg to confirm what I'm saying is true. Frozen section is not a reliable method of making a confident diagnosis in some of the cases. Maybe in some cases we can get an accurate diagnosis, but in some cases we could be wrong. 
and you don't want to base a final treatment based on something which could have a high error rate. Now I'm going to show you an example. This is what looks like a typical giant cell tumor in the distal radius. I mean, most lytic lesions like this in the distal radius would turn out to be giant cell tumors. But we fortunately biopsy everything, and this one was an osteogenic sarcoma. So uh, unusually, you could get tumors which are malignant. So if you follow the rules and you do, did a biopsy on every patient before operating, then I think we could avoid getting into trouble and you are better prepared to face this situation. Now having decided that yes, we need to do a biopsy, the next question is how to do the biopsy. So we would generally say that you should do the needle biopsy. And before doing the needle biopsy, you should know which needle to use. You should know where are you going to do the biopsy from and then go ahead and do the procedure. These are uh, several soft tissue, true cut, spring loaded needles which are available in the market. These are disposable needles. They cost about 1800 rupees, so they are not very expensive and they are uh, very easy to use. Even bone tumors which have a soft tissue component, you can just use any of these needles, get a uh, sample and send it to the pathologist and if you have representative tissue on frozen section, you are quite sure that you will get a diagnosis at the end of it. Uh, if you have to biopsy the bone, then you have the Jamsheri needle and uh, this is nothing but uh, it's, it's like a bone marrow biopsy needle which is very sharp and which can penetrate into the bone. Uh, again here if the lesion is completely intraosseous, then it may require drilling into the bone especially if the lesion is in the cortical bone or inside in the diaphysis. But if it is in the metaphyseal bone, you can with manual pressure penetrate into the lesion. We always recommend that uh, we must use imaging to guide the biopsy wherever we are not certain of where the tumor is. So we use either a C-arm, ultrasound, CT scan, any one of the methods and sometimes we use a PET CT scan to guide the biopsy. The general rule for biopsy is that it should be along the line of incision that one has chosen for the surgery and it should be the shortest route to the tumor violating minimum amount of tissue preferably only a single compartment rather than multiple and as far away from the neurovascular bundle or any other important structure that we want to preserve in limb saving surgery. So that's how we mark, we would mark the incision. If the radiologist is going to do the biopsy, we should always mark the incision so that they know what is the line along which they can put the needle in. Even if somebody else is doing the biopsy, it is best to mark it. Even if we are doing the biopsy, we always mark it and then we go ahead and do the biopsy. The, the sites for biopsy in tumors are very different from the conventional incisions which are used in standard orthopedics. Uh, the knee as you saw is not a standard midline incision. Most of us prefer to go either medial or lateral because we want to save the rectus tendon. Uh, in the shoulder, we go through the anterior deltoid and not through the deltopectoral groove because you want to have the hematoma contained within the muscle rather than tracking along the loose areolar tissue which you see along the dictopetral groove. Again in the scapula, this is going to be your oblique incision for the scapulectomy. For the TBI, it is going to be again anteromedial or anterolateral away from the patellar tendon. In the proximal femur, it is always lateral. It is always lateral because you can, it allows you to go both uh, anterior and posterior and still resect out the tumor. In the pelvis, this is the utilitarian incision that is used and because different tumors can be excised through different incisions, I think it is best to let the surgeon who is going to be doing the surgery decide where the biopsy is going to be from. Uh, whether we should biopsy from uh, the ossified part or the lytic part is again a question which is often asked and the clear rule is that uh, it is best to biopsy the tumor area which is lytic. Lytic areas are more cellular. The ossified or calcified areas are posicellular and less likely to give you a diagnosis. Uh, uh, which area in the tumor to biopsy? Uh, preferably the periphery, preferably an area which is not necrotic or, or fluid as I showed you in this case. Uh, even when one is doing a needle biopsy, it is a good idea to go in multiple directions from the same entry site so that you have a good tumor sampling from the different areas. Uh, I, we've already spoken about image guidance. The commonest 
cause of a negative needle biopsy is wrong targeting. Almost 80 percent of the negative biopsies are because it has not been targeted properly. So we must use imaging to target the biopsy. And this is a classic example I showed you. This was a lesion which probably never needed a biopsy. This was a girl who had a knee injury. An x-ray was done for the knee injury. They detected this lesion. They assumed that this is pathological. No further imaging done. They went ahead and did an open biopsy. And look at where they have done the open biopsy. They missed the lesion completely. So even in an open biopsy, they have not targeted the lesion. And this patient went on to get an infection. And she still has a draining sinus from a biopsy which was never required. I'm going to skip this for the lack of time of the technique because if we have time, then we will go ahead. Now, the needle biopsy is not difficult for the surgeon. The surgeon's learning curve is extremely small. You can learn it in 10 minutes. You can learn it having seen it in two or three cases. But the curve is very, very big for the pathologist. I think it requires a pathologist a big amount of experience to be able to report on the small amount of tissue that the surgeon would send with a needle biopsy. How to send a sample? Well, uh, in today's world, if you're going to plan to do molecular studies, then it should not be put in formaldehyde. Then you send a specimen in a separate solution. But otherwise, routinely, you can send it in, in formaldehyde solution. How much tissue? Generally, two or three cores are generally adequate if you have a good pathologist. And in our country especially, we always say that we collect the material for culture. We also collect it for AFP culture because tuberculosis is so common in India that it can mimic tumors. Uh, we must tell the patient when we do the biopsy that needle biopsy is a procedure which has a finite error rate and there is a chance that we can get a wrong report on a biopsy because you're seeing a limited amount of tissue and sometimes we may have to do an open biopsy. Uh, fortunately, with uh, having done many needle biopsies and having that experience now with a lot of centers, we are, it is possible to minimize the failures. Now, second opinion is often sought for because uh, surgeon gets one opinion from a pathologist and it doesn't match with what he thought it was. Maybe he doesn't have enough faith in his pathologist and then you ask for a second opinion. Now, it is if you're getting a second opinion, one should not split the sample. One should send the entire tissue to one pathologist and then sends these slides and blocks again for a second opinion if it is required to the other pathologist. If you have a cystic lesion, this is a common cause of getting a negative biopsy because it is only fluid. Now when you have a lesion which is cystic, it is a good idea to scrape the wall. With a J needle, you can scrape the wall, get solid tissue and the pathologist then can give you a confident diagnosis whether you are seeing a needle biopsy. Cyst. Not plain. Uh, if, that, if you get only fluid, you may not be able to get a core, in which case it's a good idea to collect that fluid and send it for cytology. So we must make sure when we get the report that we match what we are seeing on the x-rays with what has come on report, on the pathology report. Uh, there are a lot of surgeons who do not want to call their radiologist and pathologist or for some reason think it is below their dignity to give them a call and will not talk and then you get errors in the diagnosis. I think uh, we have learned over a period of time that when you have a discussion between the radiologist, pathologist and the surgeon, the diagnosis is often changed from what the original diagnosis was. And it is very important to come to a correct diagnosis if we care for the patient. So it's very important to talk. Now this is a classic example where there was a tumor coming from the anterior superior ilex spine region. Uh, it was a bony tumor, but there was a big soft tissue mass. So we biopsied the soft tissue mass and the pathologist reported this as a low grade sarcoma. Now we knew when we looked at the radiology that this is not low grade. This is, this is a high grade sarcoma. And this is where, again, you need to meet together and say the needle biopsy may have sampled a low-grade area. We know tumors are heterogeneous. And when we resected this tumor, it was a high-grade sarcoma. So that confirmed that it was. So again, a joint meeting is important. We must correlate all the information. 
Sometimes you get de-differentiated tumors and you would realize this only after the specimen is resected. This is a parostial osteosarcoma which had this area of de-differentiation. Today with PET CT scans, you can probably pick up the de-differentiation early. Before the PET CT scans, an angiogram used to be done to identify any area with an increased vascularity and then do a biopsy from that area. But sometimes only after the whole pathology specimen is out that you can identify that there is an area of de-differentiation. I mean, this is this is slide which shows that. So how do we minimize failure? In short, the rules are that you use image imaging to guide the biopsy. Uh, we must not biopsy from the obviously calcified or ossified areas. We should avoid areas which are close to a fracture or close to a callus which is forming next to the fracture and a good idea to use frozen section so that in case you have non-representative tissue, you can again get some more material without removing the patient from the theater or from under anesthesia. If you don't get a report which is clear, it's a good idea to talk to the pathologist to see if there is any additional tests which have to be done. We already discussed that we are now uh, having a lot of molecular studies which can be used to aid the diagnosis or sometimes it may be a good idea to get a second opinion from a musculoskeletal pathologist who has more experience in dealing with these tumors. Uh, in short, we must have everything fitting together. You must have the radiology picture matching with the history, the clinical findings, otherwise uh, we need to review the diagnosis. Uh, we always say that when you look at the imaging, you must suspect the diagnosis. Dr. Letson already said that your differential diagnosis should be narrowed down to two or three different things. And a pathology is only going to confirm that diagnosis. We don't give the tissue to the pathologist without any information and tell them that now you make the diagnosis for us. That would be wrong. You can minimize the failures, especially with a needle biopsy, but you cannot completely avoid them because of the inherent nature of the sarcomas that we see. And very importantly, we always say that you think before doing a biopsy. We discussed where we are going to do the biopsy from. But Dr. Jambaker has always taught me that read between the lines. If the pathologist has given a report which is more than one line, which is very descriptive, means they do not know the diagnosis. It means that you need to discuss with them what they are seeing. It is not fitting into a specific pattern. It is not a typical situation. So after reading the biopsy report, we need to think once again before assuming a certain diagnosis. Thank you. I just wanted to show this case. If Can we just show that case back? In the hip. Uh, he went to an orthopedic surgeon. Uh, his report, he got an MRI done and the MRI was reported as avascular necrosis. So the surgeon went ahead and did a total hip replacement. He cut the neck. This was a synovial sarcoma inside bone and did not realize it even when he did that. And you can see very clearly that he has replaced a perfectly spherical head. This patient did not need a replacement even if there was an avascular necrosis. Now this is a case just to show that as orthopedic surgeons, I think we must not be in a hurry to operate. I think we need to think very strongly because this patient went on to get a hindquarter amputation. And I told the patient that you need a hindquarter amputation. So he called back his surgeon and said that these doctors are saying that uh, you need a hindquarter amputation. What did you do wrong? So that doctor called me up and said, why are you telling the patient that I did wrong? I said, then you explain to him why he needs a hindquarter amputation. Now, this is going to be a problem with us. Patients are going to take you to court. And we have to think before we do something which is causing irreversible damage. And that's the entire message. I mean, this was the hindquarter amputation. There was tumor all around. We don't believe in following rules. This is a common sight in India. Wherever you say don't spit, there will be spitting there. You say don't leave footwear here, there will be footwear there. So we don't follow rules. We as a nation don't like to follow rules. But I think in tumors, we must follow the rules. If we don't follow the rules, we are going to get into trouble. We have Dr. Jambaker now to talk about the problems which are faced by a pathologist. I wanted to ask you, what about non-assessment Well, I think some of them are typical and some of them are not.
you biopsy would you biopsy everything that you plan to operate as i said so um No, no. My message was what you're planning to operate. I have given clearly. I did not talk about the chondroid lesions because we had a huge discussion just before. Um, not only do I biopsy every tumor that I treat, I walk back to the pathologist and my, I look at the eyes of my pathologist and we look at the slides together before I make a decision. Because just like you said, if they're given a descriptive term, or more importantly, if the pathologist is looking at it and I'm looking at it with them and they're 